Hey there everyone, today we're going to be looking at Kathy Acker's essay, Algeria. This was first published in 1984, and you can also find it in Semiotext's volume, Hatred of Capitalism, edited by Chris Krauss and Sylvia Lautringe from 2001. The volume as a whole is great, but there's something about Kathy Acker's essay that stood out to me from the moment that I read it. And Kathy Acker is an American essayist and writer, very well known for her postmodern style of writing, very similar to William Burroughs in many regards. And this essay is particularly interesting with the way that it is able to show a sort of international empathy, crossing lines through rather transgressive themes that slowly develop throughout this very short work to help give us an image of violence and nihilism in the postmodern period in a way that I find very empathetic, very personal, and very abrupt in a way that is very necessary. Punctuated throughout this piece are a series of remarks in all capital letters. Now, usually these come at the end of very long paragraphs to kind of go in between new sections, and they kind of blend different sections into one another. One of them is, I hate equals I love you. Another is the importance of sex because it breaks the rational mind. Another is the problem of we the colonized, uh, and how can I, who am disinherited, act? And all of these act as bridges in the larger structure of this essay in a way that really helps bring the themes together because it gives you a sketch without really actually saying much on its own. And the essay begins with a few of these on their own, one of which is particularly enigmatic. The land in Algeria is pink. Life in this America stinks. And that's on the back cover of this volume as a whole. And it's particularly interesting because, of course, obviously the sand is pink from blood. And, you know, the, the blood gets a little lighter as it's spread out on sand in Algeria. And a main focus of this essay is the Algerian War for Independence and the Algerian struggles against French colonization. And Kathy Acker is able to empathize with this moment in history in a really unique way because the Algerian War started in 1954 and it ended in 1962. But Kathy Acker is writing this in 1984. And she writes here in the beginning in 1979, right before the Algerian Revolution begins, the city is cold and dank. And you're like, wait, the Algerian Revolution didn't start in 1979. Well, the point of this is that by making these links to the sufferings of the people of Algeria, this historical event actually transcends time in a sense. It traverses over time, and it affects Acker in a very personal way, in which Acker opens up by talking about all these sexual exploits that she's engaged in. There's this sexual encounter that is lacking in punctuation. It just kind of goes on with all these various profanities and whatnot, saying at one point, my coming is an insignificant compared to your building. And it's all about this person named Cater, or Cotter. I'm going to say Cater, because I'm not sure. It's K-A-D-E-R. And Acker writes, In New York, I feel I'm a jagged part skin walking down the street. I feel part of my being no longer is. That is disgusting. That is an outrage. So from the very beginning of this essay, Acker makes clear that there is some kind of angst built up here. And this is part of Acker's general involvement in the punk movement, is 
this movement as a whole is reacting to some of the worst violences in history, which are becoming commonplace, and Acker meditates on that throughout this essay. By notating, for example, the violence of this initial sexual encounter with Cater, and then talking about how the fact of Acker lives in New York City and Cater lives in Toronto, in Canada, and there's this constant yearning that Acker feels for, and it causes this intense hatred. Acker writes, I want to bust up the government to destroy every government that's telling me what to do, controlling the me that I most want to be me. Bust up the society that causes government, the money that denies feeling and irrationality I hate. Separation from Cater makes me have to fill that separation with nothing, makes me grab at everyone, makes me hate everyone. For me, every single thing is equal to every other thing. I have to get to you. I have to get to you. I hate equals I love you. And this is a sort of Heraclitean unity of opposites. And it, of course, depicts a sort of apathy that's very common to people nowadays who are struggling with, I mean, not only is Kathy Acker struggling with love, but she's struggling with bills and whatnot, struggling with how to fill the void that has been made by Cater, and talks about the result of trying to fill this void, that there's a sort of nothingness that hangs constantly over Acker's head, that flattens all opposites into benign equals. And there's a paragraph here in which Acker seems to really exemplify the sort of consumerist focus on wanting, on needing to fill things up constantly. And presumably we can derive from that 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 is because things are exiting so quickly, that things are being siphoned through us at such a rate that it just becomes sort of unbearable, and thus for Acker, this sort of flattening of ontology. She writes, here in New York, every morning I wake up, I don't want to be awake. I have to persuade myself to wake up. I have to use my will to get food in my mouth because my heart sees no reason for anything. I don't feel unhappy. I don't think my life's repulsive. Even though I have no money for food, I have to beg friends for food. I don't care about poverty. I want. And the solitude of I want is particularly poignant here because it points to a sort of need that transcends the commodifiable human nature of, you know, I can code your wants into a YouTube algorithm or into a lunch menu of what you'll probably want. There's this sort of overwhelming want. And throughout this essay, Acker's going to build on what is that want? And in order to do that, she links this sort of primeval want to the want that is felt by the Algerian people. She says that the Algerian revolution began in May 8th of 1945 in Satif, and this is, of course, talking about the Satif and also the Guelma massacre in Algeria. She mentions how the Parti du Peuple Algérien was the first occasion for direct Algerian anger, and this is in reference to, in Satif, there was a celebration that was being prepared to capitulate the Nazi rule. And, of course, the Algerians were just happy for the Nazis to be done. And the PPA, the Parti du Peuple Algerien that I just talked about, one of the leaders, Misali Hajj, was put in jail, and the Muslim population wanted the an the anti-Nazi celebration to become a cry of the oppressed, of we want freedom, you're locking up our main people that are advocating for our freedom from French colonialism. And Acker says in the next paragraph, actually there was no such important rational plan. All people are hungry, wanting. Hungry people do not act by rational plans, but by instinct. 
And that's really important because this is mentioned later too with regards to sex, the importance of sex because it breaks the rational mind. And this is one of those all caps quotations. And we can see you know, a reader may look at this, and especially if you read this and you see all the sexual content in here, it just might seem out of place at first. But the violence of sex in Acker's love affairs with Cater links up with the violence of murder in the Algerian situation. And Acker blends these two together in a skillful way such that there is this sort of collapse of rationality. There is the I want, the I want food, I want freedom, I want the freedom to follow my instincts. And this sort of transcends all parties, for example. And this want, Acker points out how it leaves the opposing party kind of struggling to figure out how to respond. And this untranslatability of an authentic want, a desire for freedom, for liberty, for instinct, for food, for shelter, whatever it may be, in response to this, the French policeman, for example, she says, saw a beautiful Algerian boy, got a hard on, couldn't tell what he should do. The Algerians were carrying their green and white national flags and banners saying, long live Masali, free Masali, for the liberation of the people, long live free and independent Algeria. Instead of fucking him up the ass, the cop shot the beautiful Algerian boy in the stomach. People act in accordance with the energy levels of their situations. The Muslims jumped the Europeans. Anger was on the streets. The next week, the Europeans murdered 45,000 Muslims. And the sort of off-the-cuff last remark, I mean, it gets its own little paragraph. And this is all still in the historical context of the Satif and Guelma massacre. Now, of course, the, the idea of this French policeman getting a hard-on at an Algerian boy, this isn't a historical fact. This is something that... Acker adds in here to purposely make explicit the link between that want and the sort of response that it creates in, for example, the French policeman who's seeing all these people come up in a sort of revolutionary fervor of, I want, I desire, I need freedom. And this provokes a hard-on in the policeman. And it really links up a kind of, I don't know, a libidinal insecurity, perhaps, that the, instead of fucking him up the ass, the cop shot the beautiful Algerian boy in the stomach. The fact that the Algerian boy is beautiful highlights the sort of electricity that runs around him, that is his revolutionary fervor, that the French don't know how to interact with that. It's very similar to Homi Baba in The Location of Culture. He talks about this little occasion that happened during British colonialism in India. And the British soldiers were going into these various tribal lands, and they were trying to figure out how to integrate these tribes into a government that they could you know, impose their rules on and try to extract labor from and whatnot. And there was this practice that was engaged in by the various Indian tribes, and it involved these crackers called chapatis. And they were sort of like the wafers that you use in communion in, like, Catholic churches. And the tribes would shuffle the chapatis between the tribes via a messenger, and they would bring the chapati to another you know, tribal leader, and the British are trying to figure out, well, like, what the fuck does this mean? They're shuffling these wafers around, and at first there's kind of this sense of like, oh, it doesn't really matter, but then they think about like, could this be some secret signaling method of establishing a tribal allegiance against us? Could this be a declaration of war between tribes? Could it be something else entirely that we can't conceptualize? And that fear of the unassimilability of the other is exactly what Acker is getting at here. 
that there's something volatile about the other that escapes a sort of one-sided, assimilated recognition and forces the most irrational of responses. I mean, the French retaliation to the Sadiq and Guelma massacre to kill 45,000 Muslims in less than a week is crazy. I mean, people are talking about the 33 plus thousand Palestinians that have been killed primarily in Gaza. That pales in comparison to Algeria. But of course, people just don't usually know about Algeria. So the way that Acker presents the Algerian struggle is all the more important as such. So I think it was really skillful of her to put this 45,000 Muslims statistic on its own. And she mentions the just profound sense of oppression that the Algerians are in. She writes that before and after Satif, the French colonists were controlling more and more of Algeria and decimating more and more Algerians. By 1954, an average European in Algeria owned 10 times the land an average Algerian owned and earned 25 times as much moolah. And yes, that's a kind of funny little American usage of the word moolah. But of course, this is just a, it's, it's a profound injustice that in just a few decades, the, the Europeans can just totally reverse the power in Algeria. And of course, Algeria itself is struggling. She says, in Algeria, the average Muslim worker earned 22 cents a day if he was lucky. One-ninth of the population was unemployed and earned nothing. And throughout the essay, Acker's frustration is growing greater and greater. And it is really made explicit the link here because Acker says, I, Omar, live alone in a room. She calls herself Omar, linking herself to the Arab identity, to the struggle of the Algerians. And she's talking about her own struggles about money, of being constantly horny, of being scared that she's in danger of killing, that she's unable to kill. She writes, I hate myself because I do not kill, because I do not walk out of my room. And that very much exemplifies at least what I perceive as some of the mindset of people in an oppressive colonial situation of you want to retaliate, but part of you just can't. And, you know, this is something that Acker will take to some dangerous limits where she'll talk about suicide too. And I've experienced this personally with regards to my ponderings um, regarding suicide, both philosophically and extra philosophically, there's always something that keeps you attached to your life, that even when you reach some sort of rational and clear, like, hate for life, or in the case of colonialism, hate for your oppressors, there's something that keeps you in a state of complacency. And we really feel that sense of urgency, that sense of the will just being destructed against the face of its wants that it can't actualize throughout this essay. And something that's so interesting about the way Acker writes in this whole essay is it's easy to be turned off by the postmodern style of writing, especially the sort of punk-inspired kind of grungeness that's in this whole essay. It's easy to get not only confused, but just like, why is all this, as I've said before, sexual stuff in here? What is the point of it all? And there's a really exemplary short paragraph here where after she's linked her identity to Algeria via the name Omar, she specifies Whenever a cock enters me every night, three nights in a row, I ask myself, regardless of who the cock belongs to, should I let myself depend on this person, or should I remain a closed entity? I say, I'm beginning to love you. I don't want to see you again. The man thinks I'm crazy, so he wants nothing to do with me. And there's an echo here 
of a colonial mindset, particularly of the mindset of someone being colonized, which is very reminiscent of Fanon here. Fanon speaks, for example, of children in Martinique who are black but are raised watching the media that has been created by white people and the black characters in these media representations are always made to be the bad guys and they're always stereotyped and they're like these jeering evil villains that you start to empathize with which turns into a sort of self-hatred because of the stereotypes which have been imposed on one. In the same way, love here presents itself to Acker, you know, even in the form of sex, as just something devoid of all emotion in the face of, you know, her emotional, destructed nature, herself just kind of in pieces, and there's this sort of ambiguous, I'm beginning to love you, I don't want to see you again, so I push you away, this sort of you don't know how to react to new emotions. And this very much reminds me of a lot of testimonies of people under colonial experiences who are trying to cope with their circumstances. And here, New York and Algeria, across the space, across this vast Atlantic Ocean, they kind of become the same place just like I hate becomes I love you. And thus, as she writes in in these bold letters, the importance of sex because it breaks the rational mind. And rationality, especially in post-colonial studies, which Acker is maintaining a tacit connection to, rationality has a sort of dirty connotation because rationality was one of the primary reasons that colonialists were able to, quote-unquote, justify their colonization of other lands because the people they were colonizing weren't rational and they needed to be civilized as well. So these sort of terms, they get destroyed by sex for Acker, by the explosivity of sex, by also the ambiguity of sex as it interacts with Acker through her various existential perils. And jumping from that, we go straight into this long paragraph, which very precisely and abruptly tells us of the struggles of the Algerians under French rule. And I continually go back to this paragraph all the time. It really just, it rips at my heart. I Every time I read it, I don't really know how to do anything other than break down my rational mind, just like Acker talks about. She writes, The French police fashioned the Zizanes, an army signals magneto, electrodes to the Algerian rebels' ears and fingers. A flash of lightning exploded next to the man's ears. He felt his heart racing in his breast. The cops turned up the electricity. Instead of those sharp and rapid spasms, the Algerian felt more pain, convulsed muscles, longer spasms. The cop placed the electrodes in his mouth. The currents plastered his jaws against the electrodes. Images of fire, luminous geometric nightmares, burned across his glued eyelids. While the Algerian longed for water, they dumped his head into a bucket of ice-cold liquid until he had to breathe the liquid. They did this again and again. They did this again and again. A fist, big as an ox's ball, slammed into his head. The screams of other prisoners were all around him. He no longer knew he was in pain. Pain was wrong. Living was in a constant fire of torture and disgust. The moment before the Algerian went crazy and accepted horror, as usual, His greatest fear and torment was this consciousness that he, the Algerian, is about to go crazy, has to give up his mind, which is anger, and accept the horrible inequality, the French way of living he is fighting against. And there's so much richness in this paragraph, so many little literary things that are put into this. 
One of the big things is the fact that the French policeman's fist is imagined as being as big as an ox's ball. So there's a very crude sexual metaphor going on here, which again testifies to the link between the explosivity and the untranslatability, the unassimilability of sex, and that of colonial violence and oppression. And there's this loss of selfhood that we've seen echoed before with regards to Acker's reactions to sexual encounters, where the Algerian knows that he has to give up his mind, which is anger, and just accept inequality. And in the same way, Acker continues throughout this essay to exemplify the problem of we, the colonized. And the idea of we, the colonized, testifies to that empathy that I spoke of throughout. That colonization forces empathy that goes beyond geographical boundaries in a really profound way. Just every time I learn about Algeria and about the struggles of the Algerian people escaping and fighting against French colonial revolution or French colonial oppression, it just astounds me. She writes, all those people of whom we are afraid, who crush the jealous emerald of our dreams, who twist the fragile curve of our smiles, all those people we face who ask us no questions but to whom we put strange ones, who are they? What can our enthusiasm and devotion and madness achieve if everyday reality is now a tissue of lies, a tissue of cowardice, a tissue of contempt for human mentality? And there's an you know, there's an unmistakable sadness in all of this essay that I think does exactly what literature is supposed to do. It's a series of invocations because nothing else works. Because nothing else works quite like literature does at getting us to feel the pain of others. But we, of course, we don't feel it as their pain. We can't. All we can feel is our pain stimulated by outside, outside information. So, just like what Acker has been trying to do with New York and Algeria, we don't feel Algeria's pain. We feel our pain through the depiction of the Algerian struggle. And there's a sort of lamentation here, where Acker doesn't know what to do except invoke enthusiasm, devotion, madness, and just skulk, perhaps? And I think this is at least partially the most empathetic reaction that one can do. She speaks of the desire to throw down governments, but what really carries the thrust of this essay is wanting to throw down that difference between myself and the other. It's a sort of empathy that can only be achieved through this violent collision of sex and colonial oppression. She writes, Right now there is no difference between a legal and a criminal act. Lawlessness, inequality for the sake of desire, multi-daily murders of human beings have been raised to the status of legislated middle-class principles. This social structure negates our beings, makes us who are without into nothings. So there's this sense of the dispossessed are now not possessed by anything. They're possessed by nothing but the empty want. And as a result, Agar writes, I think a society that drives its members to desperate solutions is a non-viable society, a society to be replaced. And, you know, it's, it's no mistake that Acker is flirting with anarchist themes throughout of, as she says, how can I who am disinherited act? It's a real question that faces all of us. And in part, th and this is again the thrust of this essay, is you don't have to act to read. You just have to sit and understand. And maybe there's something empty about that. Similar to when Acker writes, I have to fuck, I have to fuck, I have to fuck, I. Period. There's a sort of cyclical desire where, you know, you say the same phrase over and over, and it's like when you say car. And you just keep saying car, 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 car. And eventually it stops sounding like a word. 
The same thing happens here with I. This sort of cyclical desire leads to a sort of empty subjectivity as it just kind of mulls over itself. It doesn't, doesn't know where to go from here. And this is the profound statement of childhood that Acker expresses when she says that all the time um, parents don't know how to deal with their stresses except by putting it onto their kids. And as such, every young person is just desperately trying to find a parent. And since there are no adults now, there are no other relationships. She's saying that there's this sort of universal childhood that's been adopted, similar to the universal sickness that Baudrillard talks about, of, well, we've all been reduced to this apathy of the oppressed. And this is epitomized when Acker says, Cater is in New York now. I don't feel anything for him. If you read the essay, Acker has been just mulling over Cater's very existence. She's been writing about him everywhere. But as she writes, after the French murdered 45,000 Muslims, they seized and imprisoned the rest of the rebel leaders. But the Algerian people didn't stop being angry. The young Algerian boys who were growing up knew smatterings of Marxist revolutionary techniques. They didn't care for liberal sentiments or revolutionary discussions. They weren't interested in groups. They enjoyed hating. They liked to fight. They respected violence. And that's something that Acker is trying to do, to respect violence, to respect violence in sex, to respect violence in daily life, in a way that forces us to be empathetic, forces us to be more aware. And this leads to a sort of startling conclusion where there's this kind of roughly two-page rant where she continues to use the word cunt in all capital letters. And the word cunt is used to refer to her mother, but it has more than one meaning, and really, it's untranslatable. It is the unassimilable. It's very battalion in this regard. It is that which you cannot hold on to without it just seething and going beyond your grasp. It's the divine for bataille. Kant is the other that sends a sort of electric thrill down one's spine, like the chapatis to the British. It's this unassimilable thing that you don't know how to react to. As Acker writes, all Algerian women wear the veil. The Algerian women specifically wear the haik, H-A-I-K, and it's a sort of variation on the burqa, and it has this kind of almost bandana-looking thing that's worn underneath a general shawl that goes over the face, so that for women, just the eyes and kind of maybe the bottom part of the forehead are showing. She continues, This large square cloth that covers the whole face and body makes the woman anonymous. There is no such thing as a woman. Henceforth, a woman is a cunt. A cunt can see. It cannot be seen. A cunt does not yield itself. It does not offer itself. It does not give itself. The Frenchmen who say they want cunt find real cunts frustrating. Which is, it's so funny because it's very reminiscent of Fanon's Algeria Unveiled, where he talks about the sort of strategic ambiguity of the hijab in general, and just no doubt the hike as well, because he's specifically talking about the Algerian situation, of with this sort of anonymity of the woman, there is no longer the woman in the European sense of the word. There is no gendered body here. There is something untranslatable, unassimilable, that sends a shiver down one's spine that leads to the murder of 45,000 Muslims in less than a week. It leads to, oh, I want a place ripe for colonization, but you get back this response that just, it got rid of the French. The Algerian Revolution, at least in a sense, worked. There's no longer... French colonialism there, in the at least in the most explicit sense. Now, the Algerian government is struggling, for sure, and it's fairly authoritarian today. But there's something profoundly moving about the anonymity of that which is a cunt, in all capital letters. It just, it escapes assimilability. 
And Acker ends on this weird note where she has this like page and a half rambling talking about her mother who commits suicide. And every time, instead of using her mom's name, she just uses the word the cunt, which is just, again, so it links that empathy to the mother, to the libidinal overdrive of sexual terms like cunt. And she ends with this statement in all caps, which really sums up the sort of angst, but also the power of this whole essay. Suicide and self-destruction is the first way the shitted on start showing anger against the shitters. So right there, we have the link between suicide, which is one of the most violent, self-immolatory measures possible. I'm reminded of Muhammad Muazizi in Tunisia, who self-immolated himself and started the Arab Spring in 2011 over this just profound injustice to his whole life. Muazizi is quite interesting to learn about. But that sort of self-destruction, that's the way that you've seen that people have gone to the bottom and they have nothing to do but sort of explode in anger. And that moves everyone. So I hope that this has been helpful in understanding this enigmatic, but I think really moving essay. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, postcolonialism, other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom that you can tailor to your needs. Maybe you want to read some passage together that you're having trouble with. Maybe you want to talk about some philosophy problem. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another one.